Welcome to Douglas Fairbairn Center. I'm very pleased to welcome you here tonight for, for a presentation by David Malliher and Harry Duckworth. Uh, David is a retired engineer and has devoted himself the last several years to the history of the region. Uh, Harry is a retired chemist and uh, is, uh, we've turned him over to the dark side as well. Uh, he's been studying history now for several years, so I'm very pleased uh, to see two converts making the presentation tonight. And uh, certainly we hope to convert even more moving forward. So, uh, it's a very interesting map, a very interesting presentation. You can see the actual, not the actual map, but a, a representation of the map here that we're going to hear all about. And uh, with that, pardon me? Oh, there's someone speaking. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, without uh, further ado, I believe we'll start it with Harry Duckworth. So please, come on up, Harry. Well, I appreciate very much uh, Braden's invitation for me to take part in this tonight. I realize the reason I'm here is uh, through the anchor point, which is David, but uh, I, he and I have been interested in this subject for talking for the last six or eight months, and I think we've got a pretty good story between us. So, the, as you can see, this is the title, and this is, Braden said, a representation of the map. It is, in fact, as exact as you would get unless you went to the Library of Congress in Washington and got them to pull it out of the vault, which they probably wouldn't do in a hurry. So this is your opportunity to, to see this wonderful map. What I'm going to do is uh, explain a bit about how the map came to be, what, what its importance was at the time it was prepared, and uh, some other related material. Uh, David will then tell you why the map has its merits and uh, what, what it achieved. So I'm, I'm, I am part one for that reason. Okay, so th this is just uh, telling you what we plan to do here. Alexander Henry was a Canadian fur trader in the 1770s, and uh, what we hope to do is convince you that this is indeed quite an important document. Uh, original, and all kinds of information that, while it wouldn't impress a modern map maker, uh, is very informative and took a lot of hard work to, to pull together. Now, you remember that Canada belonged to the French until 1759, when it was conquered, and within a couple of years, there were English-speaking traders trying to reopen the fur trade again. And it was a complicated business. Uh, they got all the good advice from French traders who already had lots of experience. And they, uh, and they uh, benefited from that. Uh, the very first English-speaking trader to get into the far northwest, into the Saskatchewan, was a man named James Finley. And uh, the next slide shows you uh, what you could say about James Finley as a geographer. Uh, he actually went to England after his one year in the Northwest, and Lord Hills Hillsborough was then the Secretary of State for the Colonies and was very interested in any new geographical information. So Finley was invited to talk with Hillsborough, and you can see what an impression he made as he was an illiterate person entirely unacquainted with geography or perhaps the common points of the compass could give but little light to his lordship of the country he was in. So that's the situation that there was vis-a-vis -vis fur traders and geography uh, in the early years of the rebuilding of the fur trade in the northwest of Canada. So the first the first fur trader whom we uh, knew, whom we know to have taken some serious interest in the actual geography, most of the guys just got in a canoe, they'd hired some voyagers who knew the way, they went to wherever they were told would be good, they stayed there all winter, they traded with the natives, brought the furs back, and if you asked them where they'd been, they'd be like James Finley, they really didn't know where they'd been. They knew how much the furs had been worth. 
So here's the map. Now you've got two copies of it here, but this is just to, to remind you where it comes from, the Library of Congress. The map was purchased early in the last century from a document dealer, and we don't really know what its history was before that, except what you can read on the map itself. So I'll, I'll just give you a brief description of what's, uh, what's on it and uh, some points. Uh, the key point for understanding what it, how it came to be is this so-called cartouche, the thing that's in the, uh, the upper, uh, left cor upper right corner of the map. And you can see it was dedicated to the man who at that time was the governor of Canada, Sir Guy Carleton. And if you read the small print, it's dedicated to him by this man, Alexander Henry, and an attempt was made at showing the scale of, of distance. Uh, as David will point out to you, this isn't as accurate as you might think. But what we know about the map then is that it was made with the intention of presenting it to the governor of Canada. Um, here's a bit about Alexander Henry. Uh, he's well known mostly because he published quite an interesting book with aspects of his life as a fur trader. Um, if you know something about the early history of the fur trade, uh, you may have heard of uh, Chief Pontiac, who uh, led a big rebellion against the English in 1763. And one of the greatest achievements of the rebellion was capturing the fort at Michilimackinac, which had a, an English garrison in it. And the, there was the trick that was used, because there was a, a palisade and the soldiers had a certain amount of uh, alertness, was they set up a game of lacrosse outside the, the fort. And at a particular moment, the ball was apparently by accident thrown over the palisade and everybody, the garrison was out watching the game, except for a few of the indigenous women who were inside, the, had wandered into, inside the fort with long robes on, and it turned out they had uh, weapons under the, the robes, and so the lacrosse players ran into the fort, grabbed the weapons, and before anybody knew what had happened, the fort had been captured. Now that story, it's a well-known story for people who are interested in this part of Canada's history, but it was Alexander Henry who provides that story in his book. So it's an interesting book. He has a couple of other things that he talks about, and one of the episodes he talks about is one year that he spent in the Northwest uh, somewhat uh, in the area between the Saskatchewan and the Churchill Rivers in 1775 and 1776. So he came out partly as a tourist and partly as a fur trader with other fur traders who uh, knew the way and brought him along. But that's the experience on which he, would, he was able to draw this map that we're talking about, that one year in the Northwest handsome looking man, or at least the artist uh, made him so. Uh, the book itself uh, was published originally in I think 1809, but there are editions, modern editions. This particular one's republished in 19, what is it, 19, 1901. 1901, but in fact it is a copy of some, uh, there's a copy of it available much more recently than that. It's not a hard book to get a hold of, and it's quite a lively book. Okay, I just want to look at a few, quickly at a few parts of the, of the uh, map. Here's Lake Superior. Right here is what is called the Great Carrying Place. This is just blowing up part of this. Uh, the Great Carrying Place is what's normally known as Grand Portage. This was the place where all the canoes coming from Montreal and Michilimackinac got into the Northwest. Uh, it, it was called Grand Portage because it was nine miles long over a pretty rough road, but once you got from Lake Superior over into the system of, of rivers, 
it was possible to make your way all through this whole area. Some of this is Nopaming Provincial Park, still uh, well known as a good can canoeing area. And if you ignore the, the, uh, the shapes of the things, this is actually quite a good map of that first part of the route. Here we've got what he calls Rain Lake, Rainy Lake. Uh, Wood Lake is Lake of the Woods. I'll show you Lake of the Woods in a little more detail in a moment. But the, uh, this is quite a good representation of the canoe route. There really was, was, had not been anything nearly as good as this to tell about the canoe route from Lake Superior into the Northwest. There were some maps based on Lavarandri's explorations in the French period, 1730s mostly. But uh, this is, is quite a good map of what you actually had to do to take the canoes with the goods all the way into the interior. I've just blown up areas closer to where we are now just so you can see the amount of detail there is. This is the, uh, the Big Fork River and the Little Fork River that come into the Rainy River between Rainy Lake and Lake of the Woods. And then further blow up a little bit around Lake of the Woods. And it's far from perfect, but certain features are, are shown quite clearly here. Uh, this is uh, Sable Island at the mouth of the Rainy River. This is more or less Bigsby Island and the other one is probably Big Island, although the proportions aren't right. You had to, uh, a very important and sometimes very difficult thing to do if you had a canoe brigade getting across Lake of the Woods was to get from there to there. It's what, about four miles, David? Five. Five. Um, Al Smith took us over one time and we actually had to stay an extra day before the wind was down to the point where you could get across. It's said that the canoe brigades in some cases had to wait, wait a week or two before they could get across. And then you made your way through French Portage Narrows and into the upper part of the lake where all the islands are. And there's Rat Portage and then on into the Winnipeg River. Uh, so this, this isn't the very first time that Lake of the Woods appeared on a map, but it does show a number of quite worthwhile details that uh, other people had, had not bothered to record. I'm now going to move to the middle of the map. This is Lake Winnipeg, and you can see there are a few names on it. There's Red River. Uh, this is Lac de Bonnie, which he calls Cap Lake. I think he, he felt that Sir Guy Carleton couldn't read French, and so he would translate things into English for him. Um, Pike's Head, that's uh, now Jack Head, one of the uh, uh, First Nations reserves on the uh, west shore of Lake Winnipeg. Uh, the Turn, or in French, the Detour, is Long Point, a place where the canoe brigades had to go 30 miles out into the lake and 30 miles back in order to get around that limestone ridge that there is. And then here we are, Grand Rapids, uh, Manitoba, Cross Lake behind it, a uh, lake that we call Cedar Lake now, uh, called Lac Bourbon in the French period. And then Lake Dauphin here is kind of a mixture of the real Lake Dauphin, Lake Winnipegosis, and Lake Manitoba. Um, now the shape of this, you can, if you have even in your mind's eye what Lake Winnipeg really looks like on a map. You can see this is kind of a funny shape, but we're going to get back to it because it tells us something about the, uh, the history of the map and, and what else was known about it in, in the time that it was drawn. Now I'm going to the, this is the Saskatchewan River now. There's the forks of the Saskatchewan, where the North and South Saskatchewan come together. And what I was interested in is that there are three fur forts marked here. Fort Pinnett, which I think nobody had, has heard of in any other context except this map. Uh, Finley's Fort, that's Jay, the fort where James Finley, the guy who came out early and couldn't, didn't know where he had been, uh, spent his winter. 
Patterson's Ford, another one of the fur traders associated with the Northwest Company. And then up here is the beginning of the route that the fur traders could take to the Churchill River and beyond the Churchill River to very rich fur grounds further north and west. Uh, Beaver Lake, this is now called Amisk Lake, David tells me this is the main recreational lake for Flin Flon, which is modern Flin Flon, it's just up here somewhere. But this was actually the place where Henry spent the winter that he spent in the Northwest, 1775-6. That there's a little square there, and that is in fact his post. And that post has been excavated by modern archaeologists, and they've been able to find uh, evidence that it was actually occupied for a short time. And uh, in fact, there's at least one indigenous burial there that was discovered. So this is the first part of the route into the Churchill River. And then finally, the last part I'll show you is the far, the uppermost left corner of the map, because it has this interesting object, Orabuska Lake. This is Lake Athabasca. And if you know the geography of this area, you know that Lake Athabasca does not drain into the Churchill River, which is what this is. In fact, you come up to Churchill, there's a little square there, which I think is another fur trade post. And then beyond this, there's a very complicated geography, several lakes, and then another terrific long portage known as the Methy Portage or Portage La Roche. It's 11 miles or 12 miles long. You have to go up a big hill, go along, and then you have to go down a tremendous cliff, and all the canoes that wanted to go beyond that point had to do that. And then, once you do that, you get into the Clearwater River, which is now draining in the Mackenzie watershed. And then when you get to the, uh, the bottom of the Clearwater River, just about where Fort McMurray is now, you get onto the Athabasca River, and then, only then, you get to Lake Athabasca or Abasca Lake. So Henry's map, he must have learned some stuff about Lake Athabasca from the people he traded with, but he had never been there obviously himself because he's pushed everything together in order to make some kind of a story. But uh, this is the part of the map which has very little claim to accuracy. It would have been quite misleading in fact. A few years later, other traders managed to uh, get all the way to Lake Athabasca and they discovered that there was far more to the geography than this. Um, there are, uh, as you can see, there are little bits of letterpress notes here and there. And one that I thought, thought was quite interesting is associated with a river called the Kuchinini River. Uh, now we know that Lake Araba Athabasca has not been well treated on this map. This must be very, very vaguely known stuff here. But there is something called the Kuchinini River here. And if you think about who the natives are who live in the far northwest along the Mackenzie, there is a group called the Gwich'in. They're a well-known tribe now. And Kuchinini, I think, is the first example of the name of the Gwich'in in European documents. So this map is the one that, that first uh, shows knowledge. I've just blown this, this up, I'll read you the text. Kuchinini River takes its rise near the Arctic Circle. This is all now just hearsay on uh, Henry's part. Runs to the westward, it is not known at what distance from its source or in what part it empties itself in the sea. The inhabitants are called the Kuchinini and are very numerous. They make work against the Kaunate, a nation that inhabits the lower part of this river and seems more attached to their habitations than any of the neighboring nations. It's referring to the fact that the Denny people who lived in this part uh, had a nomadic existence which was required because of the different economic um, systems they had for exploiting the uh, natural resources. They, this is the Konate, Co, are said to live in houses partly constructed underground and well secured against the attacks of an enemy. They have no trade with Europeans. I don't know who these people are. I don't recognize the name. 
I think probably somebody needs to talk with the modern Gwich'in and see whether they can say who these people are. But this is about living in houses partly constructed underground. I wonder whether these are igloos and we're actually talking about Inuit. I don't know. But this is information that came through probably several levels of informants, indigenous informants, and finally reached Alexander Henry. But I'm really quite impressed by the fact that we could recognize the name Gwich'in in this information from the very far upper left corner of the map. Okay, so that's a little bit about Henry's map. Now it turns out, and I owe this again to David who found it on the web, there are some other maps that are related to these. Uh, the William L. Clements Library is at the University of Michigan and has a wonderful collection of all kinds of early uh, North American documents of one sort or another. And among them is the papers of the man who is generally regarded as the first officially commissioned officer in the American Army, General Josiah Harmer. He was given the task in the period immediately after the American Revolution when the United States had negotiated uh, control over uh, the, the whole of what they call the Northwest, the, the American part of the, uh, of the Great Lakes. Um, he was given the task of trying to subjugate the indigenous people who lived in that area. He actually did not succeed in that. He, there was a fent uh, spectacular defeat. And he retired more or less in, uh, more or less in disgrace. But among his papers, which were the Clements Library acquired in the, I think around 1930, are two sketch maps. And written on the back of one of them is a map of the lakes in Hudson's Bay by Alexander Henry the Elder, 1775. I don't know who wrote that. It may have been somebody, a librarian. But the, it does suggest that there should be a relationship between these sketch maps and the Big Henry map. Uh, the other thing that is on the back of one of these is a statement map taken out of Captain McCarty's chest. Now that, that's an interesting comment which I'll explain to you. Uh, Richard McCarty, he was a fur trader, came from Connecticut. He spent, he was more or less a contemporary of uh, Alexander Henry married a Canadian woman in Montreal and they had three children. He spent most of his time trading in Southern Illinois. There's an important um, former Indian village, Cahokia, uh, not very far from St. Louis, but on the Illinois side. And he set up a mill there and was a kind of a, uh, a general trader as well as a fur trader. Now, there's no evidence that Richard McCarty was ever in the Northwest, was ever in any of the area that's covered in Henry's map. And he had a, a short life. I think he was trying to remain neutral at a time when the Revolutionary War was going on and you had to choose sides. And he ended up on the rebel side and he was killed by an indigenous war party fighting on the British side in 1781. And the com commandant at Detroit had McCarty's box of papers brought to him because he wanted to look and see what there might be that would be of some strategic value in fighting the war. And so the note, just going back to the last page. <coughs> Yeah, map taken out of Captain McCarty's chest. This is the box, I think, that the commandant at Detroit had. And so these sketch maps, and I'll tell you a bit more about them presently, these sketch maps uh, came into the hands of the British commandant at Detroit in 1781. Now you remember this map, um, the date that's been suggested for it is 1776. So a few years later, what we've got is a trader in the Southern Illinois region with a copy of Henry's map. Now let's just look and see a little bit about how closely related they are. Oops, next one. Uh, this just shows the areas 
on Henry's map that appear in the sketch map. So you see it's not very much of the map. It's the area around Lake Winnipeg, and then the second sheet shows the area of Saskatchewan and the route through Amisk Lake to the Churchill. So th those are the only parts that are on those two sketch maps in the Clements Library. Unfortunately, they're not, they're very light. And although there's, uh, there are some quite nice digitized uh, files available at the Clements Library website, which you can look at, uh, it, it's not satisfactory for a presentation like this to, to try to show you what those maps are like. Instead, what I've done is, well, there we are, I'm just, I'm just stating. Uh, if you're curious, you can Google the Clements Library and, uh, and then do a search there and Alexander Henry's map alleged is, is there. Uh, so the maps are, are similar for the areas they, they, uh, um, that they duplicate between themselves, but there are more place names on the Clements map and different versions of some <coughs> Clements map. Uh, but we know that McCarty had the map, had these maps, and it, I think somebody or other must have copied Henry's map and may put their own notes on it, including their own place names. The next one just shows how good the map is. What I did there, the little outline is traced from the Clements map, from the, the image of the Clements map, and you can see it's, if you look in detail at all the little bays and peninsulas, this is really exactly the same as that. So I think the, the Henry map laid down what they were going to say Lake Winnipeg looked like, and then other people, including either Richard McCarty himself or somebody whom he knew, made a copy of it. So Henry's map must have been well known at Montreal. There must have, it must have been very interesting to the people at the time because it was the first map with original fur trade data, and probably the information was shared widely. Now this is just to remind you what uh, uh, Lake Winnipeg really looks like. The main problem with this map of Henry's is the whole thing is tilted over much farther to the, the west so that the axis is southeast to, to northwest rather than almost north-south as in the actual uh, correct map. But the point I want to make here is just that what's on the sketch map has to be a copy either of Henry's map or the two of them are both copies of something else. They're that close together. And then I'm just comparing one area where I was able to, to blow up the sketch map so you can see it's rather more faded, but it again has those three forts that are on the Henry map on the Saskatchewan River. There's Fort Pinet again, it's spelled differently. Uh, the second one called Finley's Fort is called Fort Francois, and a French fur trader named Francois actually established the post where James Finley went the next year. So whoever was annotating the sketch map had uh, 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 new other information than just what was on Henry's map. And then the third one, which is called Patterson's Fort on Henry's map, is called Meadow Fort on the sketch map. And this is a post that was known in French as the Fort des Prairies, and the English translated that as the Meadow Fort. So this again, whoever put the names on the sketch map uh, had different information or preferred a different name to what Henry had used. And then I think I have one more comparison. Uh, oh, this, that's just making that point. That's basically what I've said to you already. Um, this is one more comparison. This gives you an idea of how faded things are. This is a sketch map showing Amisk Lake. Amisk is a Cree word for beaver, so this appears as Beaver Lake on Henry's map there on the left, and um, Beaver Lake on the sketch map. Uh, on the Henry map, there's this little square, uh, not labeled, but this is where Henry's fort was in 1775-76. And on the sketch map, it does say Fort Henry for the same thing. So the, whoever drew the sketch map 
uh, did record that information, and of course it agrees with what we know from, from Henry's activities. And I think that just tells us that. And then one, one more comparison. I'm really sorry you can barely see this at all. The sketch map shows the church, the upper Churchill River, but it just runs out. I'm not even sure you can see that. It doesn't lead any, to anything. Whereas Henry's map, as I said, he made an effort to finish it off by attaching Lake Athabasca to the top of the Churchill River, which is uh, quite incorrect in the geography. But Henry's map also has another one of these little squares, and it's not labeled, but it is a symbol that seems to be used on the map for fur trade posts that he felt he should mark. And there is some information from the fur trade literature that a man named Louis Primo established a post way up the Churchill, probably just about where that square is. So it could be that this is uh, Henry's uh, record of Primo's post, a brief post that uh, was built the year after uh, Henry was in the uh, was in the Northwest himself. Okay, so conclusions that I want to leave you with. Uh, the date of Henry's map, I didn't go into this uh, very much at all, but we know that Governor Carleton left Canada in 1778, so presumably if the map was intended for him, it must have been made no later than 1778, and 1776 was the year that Henry came out of the Northwest. So I have a picture of him working on his map over the next one or two years at Montreal, maybe asking other people for what they thought and what information they had. Uh, it's an original map. That's really quite an important thing about this map. It, this wasn't copied from anything else. There were, there, are, there were some printed maps at the time that were drawn originally from Lavarondi's explorations, but they don't look anything like this. Shape of Lake Winnipeg is completely different, for instance. Um, as I've said, the Clements Library sketch maps were probably either copies of Henry's map or copies of a draft that Henry also used, many differences in the place names and labels. And since Captain McCarty, who had the sketch maps, was killed in 1781, we can say that the sketch maps were made very soon after the original map was drawn. And then finally, although the map shows Lake Athabasca with completely wrong connections to uh, the uh, Churchill watershed, it does record the name of Lake Athabasca. It's spelled Orabascow, but there are different ways of spelling. It, it is a Dene word, and it has, uh, the, the sounds in Dene are not particularly easy to reproduce in, in English, so there are different spellings. And then, uh, of course, as I've said to you, Lake Athabasca on Henry's map must be based entirely from hearsay, and uh, we can't claim any accuracy for it. Okay, so that's my part of the talk, and I now hand you over to David Miller. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to get you up, Rosa? Uh, great. Would you uh, please rescue me? That's my forward and backwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Braden. Uh, yes, I, I, I will if I'm not going to walk back and forth. Thank you. 
good evening. I'm David Malaher, and thank you, Harry. Uh, Harry stepped out of the oh, There you are. Very good. Uh, a wonderful commencement to, to some details that I'm going to add on top. This is a really a, a piling on event uh, for, for this one very special map because it, it, it's, as Harry said, the first one in that territory and it covers such a huge part of the territory that uh, we're, we're giving it a, a good hard push. Um, You've, you've, you've seen that material, and the, the background is just to give you the illusion that you're, you're, you're really in that country. Uh, let's move on to this one. Uh, this is about the map uh, as, as a piece of cartography. If you come up here afterwards and look closely at the, at the uh, tracing, you can see these more pronounced lines. I've, I've, I've done the enhancement on these and there are two cartographic features overlaying one on top of the other. I think what Henry was trying to do was impress Sir Guy Carleton with some technology that he really didn't understand. The, this, this star thing is called a portalan. It goes back to the 14th century in the Mediterranean, and it has nothing whatever to do with North America at this time. But he just saw it on a map someplace and said, let's try one of those. <laughs> and these slanting lines are much more sophisticated, and they represent what's called a trapezoidal projection. That's an approximation of taking a globe, which is all a curved surface, and relaying it onto a flat plane. It actually works not too badly, but again, uh, Henry didn't understand the mathematics of it, and it's, it was, it's just a waste of time, and it clutters up the picture. So in that sense, the, the, the faded map does a better job. But if you do look at it closely, you'll see all these, these frailties. And move on now, what, did, what was Henry trying to do? He really, in my opinion, was trying to get a map all the way out to Hudson Bay and up into Lake Athabasca. This was just a, a travelogue in here. This is the real objective, and he didn't really get that. What he got was the black stuff inside here. So that's what we can really study and, and uh, understand how much he understood. Uh, I've turned all that sort of fuzzy geography into, into accurate lines. The blue stuff, this Lake Winnipeg, you can tell that. This is Hudson Bay. And the yellow material is where he didn't go, but shows it on his map anyway. The black stuff is where he did go, and he did show on the map. So we can sort of back off uh, some good stuff, some not so good stuff. But there's a third category in gray. This is where he should have gone. <laughs> and he thought he went, but he didn't. And, and that's, the, that's the problem with, with, the, with the cartography. Um, there's only 19 places on his map where we know both the date and the location. And that's nice, he gives you the sort of rate of progress and so on. But only by joining these things together can we get a, an actual path. And this little split here, that's just the, the forks in the Saskatchewan River, the north and the south Saskatchewan. Uh, all of these other places, we know where they are. Uh, we know the day he went there. This is the pages in the book. You can really track him quite nicely, even if he, we can track him. He wouldn't track himself so well. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to this Lake Superior called the Great Carrying Place. I just want to show you this. These little round lakes all have names. They're well done. I've been sort of kicking Henry around. I give him credit. He got it really well done at the beginning. Uh, there's, there's an international boundary on that, which gets all wound up later. But I'll just point this out. The names are there. The numbers are there. The height of land is there. This is the, uh, the, the Atlantic uh, draining basin, and that's the Arctic draining basin. So it's, it's a pretty good start. And we come over to here, and we are on Wood Lake. 
just call it Lake of the Woods. Now, I, I want to upgrade the, the definition of this. Harry has given us a good starting point that we can recognize things. I've just got them labeled here. That's the Sable Islands. Anytime you see this, this sort of configuration with a lake coming in here in a big strip like that, that's a Lake of the Woods. Um, this is Big Island. Now, those of you who've cruised down there said, no way, it doesn't look like it. It's called Big Island because it is big. Now, that doesn't look very big, this looks big. This map is called Bigs Bee Island. What's going on? Well, first of all, this is the Basel Channel. And when the canoeists come up the Basel Channel, they're only looking at this side. So this side's fairly accurate, but they didn't go around the backside. They don't know how big it is. Only people with airplanes got to know about that. So Big Island doesn't look big, but that's it. This is Bigsby Island, and it's extra big because this piece of it is Dawson Island, and that's uh, Bigsby Island. And there's a little stream in between the two. Doesn't quite show. This is painted, split, split rock and painted rock island. Again, they only get one look at it, and there's the whole map. And all these islands up here, I've just called them many islands, but this is where you get most of the 14,000 islands, all those little dots up there. So the, the, the approximation, I think, is quite admirable. Uh, the, this would be the Rainy River coming in here. Uh, the War Road River down here, town of War, War Road, the Northwest Angle Inlet, where the most northwesterly point is. It, it's, it's actually not bad. Now, I want to do Lake Winnipeg because it is such a major feature of the entire map. You can see it over here. This isn't colored blue, but this is, this is the most central place on the whole lake, and indeed, it took a long time to go through there. It's a difficult passage, and I'm just going to take you through it very analytically. Uh, Harry has pointed out that the shoreline is not bad. It slopes over the wrong place, but it's, it's not bad in here. Uh, and I, I, I agree with that. So what I did was slice this right through here and just put the pieces back together to reduce the amount of clearance. Now we have a realistic narrows and the proportions are pretty good. And then after that, it tilted up about three degrees and now it matches nature without my really reconstructing the map at all. And it is remarkable, in my opinion, how accurate all this is. It's, it's, uh, it's marvelous. Uh, he didn't know he, uh, well, did he have a compass? If he did, did he know how to use it? And if he did, why didn't he? But there it is. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty good Lake Winnipeg. Now, this is the final touch of, of Lake Winnipeg that I, I can do. I've got these 19 dates, I've got locations. Uh, these are distances on the water. Start here at mile zero, 20 miles, 40 miles, 60 miles, and so on. He finally gets off Lake Winnipeg at 312 miles. And we can follow him all the way through here. This act, this Lake of the Woods, by the way, is, is, is quite precise. Lake Winnipeg. No, sorry, Lake Winnipeg, this is quite precise. And there's the Narrows. Uh, this is where the Dauphin River comes in, and that's a long, long point. And uh, Grand Rapids is up here. Um, at this point, we've got to bring in some friends. We start at the bottom here, and uh, Peter Pond joins them in here, uh, which would be approximately here. So Peter Pond probably came out of the Red River and uh, joined uh, this big party that uh, uh, Henry was a part of. But there was another uh, event, uh, you know, uh, we come along here. I didn't specify it because it's such a, a, a broad uh, range. Four men fell out of their canoe and drowned. That's a bad thing, even though maybe there's over 100 men in here and they could sort of get along without them. It's not a good thing, you don't, you don't drown the guys. Further on, uh, overtaken by Frobisher. 
and that would be just in this area in, in here. Uh, sorry, up there. It's mile 140, mile 140 is in about here. So the, a big crew uh, of the Frobisher family, of the Frobisher Corporation almost, overtook Henry. I don't think it was a surprise. Uh, they work well together. Uh, they have a lot to do with the conclusion of the, of the whole story. I, I see it as a pre-planned meeting uh, without waiting for anybody. If anybody was late, they were late. But the Frobishers uh, propelled themselves faster than Henry did, and they met in here. That gave them an opportunity to spend several days waiting for perfect weather so they could paddle across this wide area. And they probably used that opportunity to discuss what they were gonna do next as they approached uh, the Saskatchewan River further up. And finally, they're, they're into the uh, Saskatchewan River system. <clears throat> of course, this is the, actually the end of the Saskatchewan River where it meets Lake Winnipeg. Uh, and there's, uh, although there's a grand portage down there on Lake Superior, this is a pretty grand portage too, it just, but it's called Grand Rapids. Uh, that's a significant achievement to get through the lake and lose only four people. After they reached uh, the Saskatchewan River coming from uh, the Grand Portage, Cumberland House was the destination. I've marked Cumberland House right there. Cumberland House is just off the picture here. This is Beaver Lake or Amisk Lake. There's the fort that uh, Henry went to for the winter. Henry wasn't alone. Thomas Frobisher of the Frobisher family joined with Henry to make an, a sort of an amalgamation, a, a literal grouping of the, of the, of the senior uh, people paying for this journey and, and taking all the, all the risks of that nature. So those two guys went into their fort here, spent the winter. Henry uh, took, a, took a jog. He, the winter's long and boring, so he left um, Beaver Lake, walked out here, to roughly the, the uh, north and south Saskatchewan River. Maybe he didn't get quite that far. These are the forts that Harry mentioned. But he got out here somewhere and, and reported what he saw, snow on grass. But that's a fact. Nobody in Montreal knew that. So this is fresh information. Uh, that's Cumberland House. And that's uh, Amisk Lake. So we're gonna move on now and have a look at what happened a little later, not in, in 1775 or 76. We're now up into the 1806 period and uh, 1829 and see, there are other people interested in this territory. It is not exclusive to anybody. And Choche Pewete, uh lives locally. Peter Fiddler of the Hudson's Bay Company met him, and between the two they discussed, where am I, what do I do now, where's the Saskatchewan River? This map is all by this person, and turned over to Peter Fiddler, who then incorporates it into his own mapping. He gives credit, it's not that he's stealing it, uh, he's grateful to have it, and he makes good use of it. And what he has in it is the Cranberry Portage, a mile and a quarter. And if you take that portage, it'll get you into the Saskatchewan River. Reading these um, simplistic maps is not, <laughs> they're simplistic maps, but they're complicated to read. Here is uh, just a few years later, 1819, when the John Franklin was sent out here by the Royal Navy to find his way into the Arctic, which he, pretty well did, but it took him a couple of tries at it. There's Cumberland House. Uh, you see it on the map there. And this is Beaver Lake or Amisk Lake. This is what um, Franklin recorded. Now his detail work represents a, you know, a well-trained Navy officer. But do you really get any benefit out of it? it it's so complex that it, it's almost harder, certainly harder to tell where you're gonna go than, than, than this map. So you're sort of playing both sides of the fence when you ask for an accurate map. 
you can get so loaded you can't read it. Uh, this led to uh, more confusion than anything else, but remember the objective of this whole exercise is fur. Fur equals money, and we want the money. So how do you get the fur? And the fur is going to come from Lake Athabasca. Lake Athabasca, well, we don't quite know where that is, but it's somewhere up there, up the Churchill River. This is where everything goes topsy-turvy, because if I just take this big map here, uh, that's sort of the district where we're talking about, but I'm just moving up into this. And for all intents and purposes, Lake Athabasca is shown being the source water of the Churchill River, which it simply isn't, not even close to being there. But that's what Henry understood from all this background that he's had. That's the best he could figure out. He did know, because he was told this by the people, Hudson's Bay Company people were at Cumberland House, the Indians and so on would talk to him, that as soon as spring breakup comes, the fur will come out of Lake Athabasca, down the Churchill River, this just leaves out the Medi Portage altogether, down the Churchill River, and they're gonna take all that fur out to Hudson Bay, or they're gonna take it to Cumberland House, and that's the money. All right, boys, this is what we're gonna do. We're going to leave our camp here on Beaver Lake, and we're gonna go upstream, and we're gonna, we're gonna use Frog Portage as a, as a waiting place, and we're gonna be way ahead of the Hudson's Bay Company. Well, we're gonna camp out here, and that's the Churchill River, and the fur will come to us, not to the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, they waited around for a week or so, and then they got on the river and they paddled towards the, the uh, oncoming brigade because they, they really, really wanted this stuff. And they got it. They got 12,000 pelts. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. For one winter's work, 12,000 pelts. They packaged them up pretty quickly and, and got them out to, out to Montreal. But what they left behind, what Henry left behind, was this artificial, erroneous location of Frog Portage vis-a-vis -vis Lake Athabasca and, and Cumberland House. This is just a scramble. Uh, it, it's, it's impossible to straighten it out on here. It's, it's so far off. But the deed had been done. The money was in the bank virtually. It was in the, in the canoes and it was, it was going out. And the loser was the Hudson's Bay Company. And the winners was not yet the Northwest Company. That, that was to be um, inaugurated within the next few years. But the, this, this trial uh, trip into here uh, proved that there is good communications, there's good fur, there are friendly people, but we can do business in there. Now, friendly between me and you and I stole the 12,000 pelts and you lost them all, that's maybe not so friendly, but uh, as of yet, nobody got shot. So that's a good thing. What is, what's behind this problem of, of the lake and the things don't match up is that there's a lake in here called I'm going to get you off this map here we'll just we'll just jump off that right away quick uh, this is northern Manitoba that's Cumberland House that's Frog Portage and this is the Churchill River and it's not up there where Lake Athabasca is that's just not the way it happens. Because nobody knew this, that the Lake Athabasca flows into the Arctic Ocean. And the Churchill River and Amasco Lake flow into Hudson Bay. They were never intended to be connected by nature. And the culprit was Wollaston Lake. It's, it's not that Lake Athabasca is sort of out of position. It's that Wollaston Lake flows two ways, east and west. And if you don't know that, you make a big mistake. So 
of the outflow from Wollaston Lake goes to the Arctic, and 90% comes down this way. When you know that, then you can figure it all out. Wollaston Lake is the world's largest by flow lake. There are others, and they do, you know, have, have two outlets. But Wollaston Lake is unique, and it's Canadian, and it's part of the first story. So that, that's how the map got all messed up. And at roughly the same time, 1802, other maps are coming along, other people are exploring this country in addition to what Henry did, 75 and 76. And Aerosmith, by far one of the top, uh, not surveyors, cartographers of North America and other parts of the world, we got a hold of this information and he put it on a map that is pretty good. It is certainly an upgrade in the hydrology. There's Wollaston Lake and there's no flow. We're not, we're not cheating here. Uh, that's good. That's, that's good. Um, that's Frog Portage and the Beaver Lake is down here. Uh, this is the evolution from the trying hard by the seat of the pants to get something down on paper. And within 27 years, um, there's a corporation called the Northwest Company. It is already five times the size of the Hudson's Bay Company. So were they successful? You bet they were successful. Uh, although in the end, just to complete the story, it was the Hudson's Bay Company that took over the Northwest Company. So that's another, uh, that's another lecture. Uh, but Frog Portage uh, lives uh, in, in, in infamy afterwards and Wollaston Lake, those are the two jokers in the deck. And there we are, ladies and gentlemen, we've met Alexander Henry. Thank you. Are there any questions? Either Harry or David. I'm curious about the um, manufacture of the map. So, how did he do it? He had that great big board and he was drawing and he was painting and he was typesetting and he if you'd like to join our little group, and, and, and Harry and I would love to have you come and help answer that question. <laughs> yes, we're still puzzling over how it, how it happened. Even as far as, did Carlton ever actually see the map? We, we don't know that either. Uh, you, can, you can take one point or, or the other. Uh, there are certain ways of drawing maps, and I, I'm sure they had to share the, you know, what everybody else did. You get a piece of blank paper and you start drawing. Uh, uh, well, this is, this is, this is made of, of six sheets of paper. There's a, there's a sheet there, and that's a fold line. That's another sheet, that's a fold line, and so on. That's across the top and the same thing across the bottom. So they glue it all together, and that makes them big, one nice big sheet. But the, the, these are all, th this is full size, so that's the sheet of paper right there. That would be a stand, pretty standard size in the, in the, in the making of maps and, and, and large documents in the, in the uh, 18th century. Um, what, what would you, <laughs> if you were on that journey, how, how would you tackle it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, it's a remarkable map. There's, I think there probably was. I think that the, the, the portion that I showed you uh, down here at the, at the uh, beginning of the, of the, of the map, uh, where all these lakes are all nicely lined up and there's none of them missing, uh, that probably came from another surveyor, another piece of paper, or could have. The suspicion's pretty strong there. As you come further up into Lake of the Woods, uh, well, somebody knew something. I mean, you can't just be lucky and, and guess Big Island and, and all that stuff. So there was some extra help going on. Uh, but by the time we're up into here, um, no. 
and, and that transition, this is why I, I spent so much time detailing uh, Lake Winnipeg, because it's so good. I wanted to see if there was a specific flaw that would say, ah, this is where the good guys left, but they were there all the way through. And how did they get the sense of how big Lake Winnipeg was? I mean, when traveling at one one oh, side. Well, <laughs> that probably is part of the excuse for getting it, you know, in the wrong orientation. But uh, they they knew they had an average speed, let's say three miles an hour in the history of the, of the canoeing in the, in, the, in the fur trade. Three miles an hour is a good everyday average. So if you paddle for 10 days, you, you at, 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 at for, for 10 hours a day, for 10 days, uh, you'll, you'll start to accumulate some mileage. Yeah, you can tell how far you've been, but how do they know where the other shore is, where ah, the beginning is an extent? Well, so they didn't really. They didn't, didn't see they, they, they didn't really. And, and nor, nor is there much detail on this side. So that's, that's the giveaway, that they were doing a good job following the, the west shore or their left-hand shore. And, and they, they could see across, you know, occasionally. And they had um, uh, local people uh, paddling. And they, 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 they could say, you know, Barron's River is over there and Blood Vein River is over there. So, uh, so you, you get one side that's pretty good and the other side that's, that's more uh, conversational. It's, it's, it's tough going. Did the indigenous people have any maps or? Well, they had, they had the, the particular map that I, I showed from the name that I can't recite uh, too, too, too quickly. Um, there, this, 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 they had this sort of information. This, this is from the, from the native people and it's, it's, it's accurate. Uh, nothing wrong with it if, if, you're, if you get used to, to working with it. The alternative is, was, is Franklin, which is almost over detailed. There were a couple questions for you. When they were mapping like the woods, were they assuming that the Northeast quadrant was the Alno Peninsula, like that's what they thought was the shore? Ah, the Alno Peninsula, the famous Alno Peninsula. The Alno Peninsula is named after Father Aldo, <clears throat> as you probably know. But that name didn't go on maps until the late uh, 19th century, way before this. And of course, um, Alno uh, died in 1736, so the information was available, but it didn't reach the sort of surveyor general and, and put on a, on, a, on a map. There was no name for all, all the Alno Peninsula, or, or everybody had a name. Sorry, what I meant was when they were drawing the lake, because it looks nothing like Lake of the Woods, except for those big islands, were they just assuming that the Alno, what we now know as the Alno Peninsula was the northeast side of the lake? Let me just get back there. Whoops, was that it? No. There. Okay. Do you want to come up and, and point? I'm just wondering because they got the island in Bixby. Were they just thinking that the Alma was the north side of the lake and they didn't oh, know oh, 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 oh. Uh, Probably neither. Uh, my my uh, way of looking at it, and I've, I've looked at a lot of maps of Lake of the Woods and who did them. The the they they had to have a guide. Start with that. No white man ever went through there by, by himself. They always had uh, native people helping them. They had figured it out a long time ago, and they weren't going to waste their time sightseeing. They knew the way, and they knew the way by not using or getting mixed up in the Alno Peninsula. So essentially, they never saw the Alno Peninsula. They didn't know what they were missing. And it, it, it took, well, there'll be another lecture on how they found the Alno Peninsula. <laughs> but that's the best I can say is, is that they never saw it. My other question is, what piece Wallace can lake? Uh, well, Wallace can <coughs> close out 
Two different ways, but what feeds Wollaston? Oh, just local drainage. Okay. Probably about a hundred mile radius. Uh, so it's a pretty good catchment area. And uh, the people who commonly went through there all knew about it. And it didn't bother anybody. But if, if none of these correspondents to uh, Henry uh, thought it was worth telling him. And he just got caught. It, 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 note that, yes, the map is flawed there, and pretty seriously flawed, but it didn't stop them. <laughs> they said, oh, okay, well, we'll get started here. And we know where here is, and, and we'll work our way out from there. Brayden? Oh, John. I think it's wonderful when you get a couple of dedicated researchers looking at something so old that's what they were heard about before and drawing all this information out of it. I'm particularly interested because of much of that territory you talk about is country that I've covered and I'd love to have heard this lecture 50 years ago. <laughs> For example, I was on the west side of Amos Lake near the mouth of the Martin Drinking River. Yes. So I don't know with the port or if I've researched on it, trying to find it. Some, uh, well, that's, that's, that's really interesting. This is Harry's specialty on there. So, uh, Harry, meet John. <laughs> Hi. The, um, the, there was an archaeologist uh, on that site, I think about 1955, who was shown it by a local indigenous elder. So there was apparently a memory of that fort all the way back to the 1770s locally. Yeah. What are you there, John? 1991. 1991. Okay, Am Amisk Lake by 1991 was a, a popular summer resort lake for the people of uh, Flin Flon. So it was Flin Flon, yeah. Yes. Did, were you, when you were there, you were on the, uh, were you at the mouth of the, of the Sturgeon River? No, we, we were actually, uh, yeah. I was supposed to be uh, an adventure, we were staying at a uh, hotel on the east side. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, just a, a, a general comment about the uh, Amos Lake and, and uh, Athapath and the uh, Cranberry Portage, et cetera. I grew up in Flint Okay. Okay. So I canoed that all those routes back in the 60s and 70s. Terrific. Um, the port, it was generally common knowledge that port existed and uh but it was you know a grass yes overgrown with no. trees and all that sort of did stuff. you go into beaver lake do you like to call it beaver lake or amisk lake yes it's beaver lake to everybody who's there okay okay so amisk lake on the map it's beaver lake it's beaver lake too. yes yeah. all right i grew up my cottage my family cottage was on that so, ah, that's what I wanted to ask. I know I that intimately. I, I go fishing, I go fishing here. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you know that you can come out of Athapap to Goose Lake. Oh yeah. And Goose Lake into yeah. the, and yeah. The, the, the representation there, I'll say, is remarkably accurate. Yes, the, yes. The, the river may actually come out over here, he's showing it over on the yeah. east side of the yeah. southeast yeah. or the southwest. Yeah. And when you go down through Goose, Goose Lake and Reed Lake and Rocky Lake and, and those get down to Saskatchewan River and come around the house or go across the mile and a quarter portage into Cranberry Lakes and about the grass river. Right. Like that. Right. It's, it's amazingly accurate. Yes, it is. Say. It is. And as I say, I'm 15 or the 1670s, I knew a lot of that. Yeah. So it's, it's quite a lot. The, 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 the details that, that are right are, are quite marvelous. Yeah. It's this gross thing that, that is, is sort of upsetting. Yeah. Sit too. Okay. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Harry. Excellent presentation. We had a round of applause for.
you can go certainly uh, avail yourself of this map here. It's very interesting. Uh, and it's one of those things where the more you look at it, the more interesting it becomes. So certainly take a look at that. And uh, I'm sure Dave and Harry would be happy to, to speak with you as well.